Welcome to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. Each week we talk about heart rate variability and how it can be used to improve your overall health and wellness. Please consider the information in this podcast for your informational use and not medical advice. Please see your medical provider to apply any of the strategies outlined in this episode. Heart Rate Variability Podcast is a production of Optimal LLC and Optimal HRV. Check us out at OptimalHRV.com. Please enjoy the show. Welcome, friends, to the Heart Rate Variability Podcast. I am Matt Bennett. I am here with my good friend and uh, often guest, if not co-host, uh, on uh, the podcast, Dr. Ina Hazan. Uh, Ina, welcome back. Good to see you. Uh, I'm so excited for today's topic. But how are you doing today, my friend? I am doing great. I'm super excited to talk about this. It's always awesome to talk with you, but you're absolutely right. This topic, I am super thrilled about in particular. <laughs> Me too, because we've been working on this for, I, I was trying to count it, maybe over two years, I think, uh, in the works. And and just uh, for our listeners' information, we're going to talk something specifically uh, about the Optimal HRV app. Now, if you're not using Optimal, obviously, Ina and I think you should be. But if you're not, I would really encourage you to stay tuned because we're going to talk about uh, some frequency, especially low frequency uh, measurements and how to use that in a biofeedback context uh, to improve overall health functioning of the nervous system. So um, really, and, and if you haven't listened to Dr. Fred Scherer's episode on the frequency domains from a couple weeks to go, ago, I highly encourage you to go back and listen to that. That was just such a, a powerful episode. And really what we're doing in this episode is how one uh, company, Optimal HRV, is using that science to help people practically um, improve their health and wellness using HRV biofeedback, um, which is why Ina and I know are both excited uh, about this announcement of uh, Ina, what we're calling Optimal Zone. So I will just sort of throw out uh, the general question as you've been the the scientific genius fueling uh, this effort. Um, tell us what Optimal Zone, what, what is Optimal Zone? To put it briefly, um, Optimal Zone uh, tells you how efficient is your HRV biofeedback training. So it gives you feedback about each particular uh, biofeedback training session. Um, it tells you whether you are uh, on the right track or if you need to make some adjustments to how you're doing your training. Awesome. Wow. I, I should have wrote that down because uh, that, that is a great summary. So th there's two aspects to this. As somebody who's been obsessively uh, testing this um, over the last couple months is one is the in-person or in-practice feedback. And what, what we're doing is we're doing a rolling 60 second measure of low frequency power. I believe I'm saying that right. So I, I, I guess even though I, I think I'm, I'm putting it out there right, uh, I've got the world expert on this on the podcast. So can you explain why we're doing it that way? And when something lights up to say you're in optimal zone, what is that uh, telling us about uh, what we're experiencing in our practice? So the reason that we are displaying uh, your, the results in that 60 second rolling increment, me, which means that when you first start doing your HRV biofeedback practice, you won't get the optimal zone right. feedback until 60 seconds into it. Uh, and the reason for it, we need to gather sufficient data in, a, in order to give you um, accurate uh, feedback. So uh, low frequency power uh, tells us um, where are your uh, where are your spectral frequencies uh, congregated um, right as, as far as your heart rhythm goes, right? So your um, uh, heart rate signal it consists of a bunch of different frequencies that are mixed up together. Um, and when we are breathing at a resonance frequency breathing rate, uh, the heart rate rhythm tends to concentrate in the low frequency range, uh, but we can't get that measurement from one or two um, heartbeats. Uh, we have to have sufficient data in order to um, be able to tell you accurately where is your 
um, heart rate rhythm actually um, concentrated. Um, and it seems like that, you know, 60 second um, time uh, increment is uh, long enough uh, to give you accurate data without being too long, you know, so not keeping you without any kind of feedback uh, for for too long. So it seems like an optimal amount of time um, to gather um, to gather data. Absolutely, absolutely, and and it's kind of as as I've been playing around with it. It's it's an interesting thing because you know you 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 can I go in and then I come out, but but sometimes I I come out. I I believe at least because maybe. I lost focus 30 seconds ago, but but that sort of rolling piece in there again, it's taking that accumulation of, of that low frequency. And if I'm correct, what, what we're measuring with the low frequency, if if I was a good student of Fred's, is really uh parasympathetic activation, ventral vagal activation. So where we're seeing we're 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 basically getting what we want out of the biofeedback practice, if I'm correct. Uh, yes. So it is um, telling us, you know, uh, again, whether we are optimizing that practice, um, we need to be, um, you know, primarily uh, in the low frequency range uh, in order for uh, for this practice to guess to get us what we want. Uh, and low frequency power comes from the barrel reflex, your blood pressure uh, reflex, and your parasympathetic nervous system. And so it's basically that um, ideal uh, zone, the optimal zone for training uh, the vagal nerve um, and improving its ability to uh, regulate our overall um, activation. Uh, so in order for us to get the most out of the training uh, during residence frequency breath practice, we need to be well, uh, ideally, um, you know, at least uh, you know eighty percent or more uh, within that uh, low frequency uh, range, and this is why this feedback uh, is so uh, important. Because, as you said, you can get a little bit distracted, or you know, something is happening in the background. Your breathing, uh, you know, is off a little bit, and you may not uh, notice. Um, you might not notice right away. You might not notice at all. Um, and then you've spent 20 minutes, uh, but you didn't actually get the most out of that training. Because in order to actually strengthen your vagal nerve, in order to strengthen your nervous system's ability to self-regulate, you have to be in the low frequency range. Otherwise, it's, you know, just sitting breathing is a nice thing, but it's not going to help you as much with um, heart rate variability. Uh, so this way, we're really ensuring that you are making the best um, out of your uh, training. You know, if your mind wanders off for a second or two, if your, um, you know, your heart rhythm jumps out of the low frequency range for just a few heartbeats, not a big deal. Um, and, you, you know, your um, optimal zone percentage may not even change uh, all that much, or it might, might drop just a little bit, but certainly not enough for their um, the app to give you warning, like, hey, you know, pay attention to your breathing. Uh, but if you've been out of the low frequency range, say for 30 seconds, uh, that is uh, that is significant. Um, and the app will tell you, hey, you know, bring your attention back uh, this way, ensuring that if you do get distracted and are not as efficient in your training, it's only for a very short amount of time and you're able to get back uh, and again, uh, use the time that you are dedicating to this in the best possible way. So one of the things I've been, you know, I, I've been fascinated with, and, and I, I, I like, what does it feel like to be in low frequency? Um, and that's something like, as, as I've been testing this out, I, I think I'm still discovering because one of the things I find interesting, and, and again, it could just be the end of one, which is Matt. Um, it may not be everybody's experience, but there seems to be, and I, I've talked to some other uh, folks on our team that are testing as well, that in the morning when I'm more awake, aware, if I'm testing it at like 10 a.m. when the, the caffeine is kicked in and I'm I'm kind of at my like kind of peak uh, awake, I, I seem to find it a lot easier. I'm in optimal zone a lot more than when I do it before bed where I'm in a, I would say more relaxed, probably getting tired stage. So I I, I wanna make a statement and then you can kind of uh, take it, correct me if I'm wrong. 
I, I don't equate optimal zone with necessarily uh, relaxed. Um, I, I definitely wouldn't equate it to being tired because I think I'm, there, there's a distinction there. Can you talk about like how, when we're in low frequency, what kind of state is optimal zone? Uh, from, hey, I'm ready to go run a half marathon to I'm ready to go to bed, somewhere in between. Where, where, are, we, where are we helping people reach a state when they're in optimal zone um, and can get themselves there? I think it does feel differently to different people. It's probably, this probably isn't a universal um, state uh, that would be descriptive for everybody um, as to how it feels to be in the optimal zone. Uh, but uh, you are absolutely right. It is generally, it's definitely not about being relaxed. It's most definitely not about being tired or sleepy uh, or anything like that. Uh, being in the optimal zone means that you are regulating optimally. Right? It means that you are in a state of optimal self-regulation. Um, and, you know, how optimal that self-regulation is, is going to increase, you know, as you uh, practice heart regulatory training. But, you know, to the best of your ability at that point in time, um, optimal um, optimal regulation. For some people, it might feel, um, you know, especially if they're coming at it from um, being quite activated and, you know, dropping into the optimal zone might feel a little more relaxed, um, might feel more calming. It just might, might feel like there is less intensity um, of uh, whatever is going on right now. Um, for others, they might actually feel more focused and a little more alert. Yeah. Um, so for some people, um, they might start feeling more sleepy, uh, you know, especially if they are doing this in the evening and the body is already preparing for sleep, then, um, you know, that might be the case. Um, I think the context of the training also makes a difference. Uh, you know, if you're doing this in the morning, you're preparing for the day, you are more likely to um, feel more focused and more alert. Uh, you know, if you're doing your training, uh, you know, on the court uh, sideline, preparing to, you know, jump into a game, um, you are um, more likely to, you know, feel ready to go, right? It may be more of a state of readiness. Um, and, you know, if you are, you know, on the basketball court and, you know, you're sprinting and then you have to stop and shoot, um, you know, and you take a, a couple of these, you uh, help breaths just to, you know, get you, um, you know, into that optimal zone long enough, you know, to be able to shoot, uh, it might feel just slightly calming so that you can stay still to make the shot. Uh, so it, it, it very much depends on uh, what you're doing, what's going on, um, and what state you were in uh, prior to this, uh, because what ultimately the optimal zone is, is a state of optimal self-regulation, and that's going to depend on the context. So when we shift out of optimal zone, if I understand it correctly, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to be a good uh, student of both yours and Fred's here. So let, let me see. We're, we're then getting more high frequency power coming in. Well, what? So obviously we want low frequency during a biofeedback practice. And if we're prepping for something and using resonance frequency to get ready to perform or even like i said i find it really helpful for my sleep quality um as well in the evening you know as as, as what what kind of then knocks us out i mean is it just like we we get more high frequency in there well what's more sympathetic activation um but what what is kind of going on uh when we get knocked out of this zone that we're we're shooting for it depends on what knocks us out. Uh, so if you're doing your residence frequency uh, training and you get distracted, um, you know, by a sudden worry, oh no, um, you know, I have this thing coming up tomorrow and I'm not ready for it. And you know, what's going to happen, right? So that kind of ruminative state, um, you're much more likely to end up in the very low frequency um, spectral rhythm. Uh, that one is, uh, um, associated uh, with in those short-term recordings is associated with vagal withdrawal, right? So while um, in the low frequency state, your vagal nerve is engaged and being trained um, and, uh, you know, doing its uh, practice. Um, and if you get knocked uh, over into that ruminative state, 
your spectral rhythms you know, shift into the very low frequency range, meaning that the vagal nerve has, um, you know, has taken um, itself out of, uh, you know, of the picture to, to an extent, um, right? So it's withdrawn, it's not nearly as engaged um, and that then you're in the very low frequency range. Uh, or um, it might be that you've fallen asleep. Um, you know, maybe you're a little bit sleep deprived or, you know, just extra tired. Um, so you are, uh, what knocks you out is actually like drifting off to sleep. Um, then you're much more likely to end up in a um, high frequency um, range, uh, which is more parasympathetically uh, uh, driven. Interesting. So, and, and again, I, I believe I'm right in saying when we talk about low frequency, we're really talking about training. Am I correct with this? It's not like you want to be in optimal zone the entire day. You, this is like, you know, like, like I said, if you want, if you want to bulk up like Matt, um, I'm flexing there for those uh, who don't get the joke uh, just on, a, on the audio. Uh, if you want to, if you want to bulk up like Matt, you know, you're not going to do curls 24 seven. So Optimal zone is still a training tool and, and residence frequency allows us to bring that training tool uh, to shooting a free throw in basketball or taking a few residence frequency breaths before a big meeting or presentation. So we're kind of training that, and I know the vagal is a nerve, not a muscle, but we're training the strength of that nerve in order to perform and then we got this little tool in our back pocket that we can pull out just to get that extra regulation when we need it. Am I thinking about that uh, correctly? Absolutely, yes. So this is a really important point uh, because uh, many uh, people do end up thinking that, oh, I got to be breathing at my, you know, five breaths per minute all the time. Um, and then they can't. <laughs> and then they go, oh, my God, what am I doing wrong? Um, so the reason you can't is because, well, you shouldn't. Um, a resonance frequency breathing rate is quite a bit slower um, than uh, your typical breathing rate. So uh, you're not going to be able to uh, walk around and do stuff um, and be effective in your day, breathing five breaths per minute all the time. You certainly won't be able to go for a run or shoot a basketball, right? That's right. just not going to happen. Um, so uh, this, this, like you said, uh, it is a training tool. This is your 20 minutes a day uh, training um, and if you've done that training um, and you are uh, about to enter a challenging situation, then just a couple of breaths, you know, at your resonance frequency as a reminder for your nervous system as to what it needs to do, um, you know, works quite well. Uh, you know, or you know, if you've been in a very challenging situation and you know you're done with it and you just need a little bit of a break, you need some recovery time. Uh, again, getting into your resonance frequency breathing rate can be super helpful in order to allow your mind and body to recover. Uh, most optimally. Uh, but but really, uh, that's it. The rest of the time, uh, we do want your breathing to be healthy, but it, there is no need for it to be um, in the resonance frequency range. And in fact, um, it's actually not good for you uh, to be in the resonance frequency breathing all the time. The reason for it um, is because we want your heart rate signal to be messy and complex at your normal baseline. Um, you know, a messy, complex uh, uh, heart rate signal is a healthy one. Uh, so when we shift our breathing rate uh, into low frequency, uh, that signal becomes very straightforward. Uh, it's mm -hmm. all concentrated in the low frequency range. Um, and the high frequency and the very low frequency are almost non-existent. There's very, very little of that signal. Uh, and while that's helpful for training, um, that's not how we want to walk around. We want the high frequency. We want the very low frequency. You know, we want the mix of all of these frequencies uh, to be there uh, when we are going about our day. Otherwise, it's actually not good for for the cardiovascular system. Um, so, not only sh you know is it not uh, possible to be um, breathing at resonance frequency all the time, it's really just not a good idea. So not don't do it. You, know, you use this as your training uh, tool. Use it as your recovery tool. Um, use it as your, you know, focus tool, uh, but not as a all the time breathing. And one of the things that, that you know, has been a curiosity amongst our team as, as we've, you know, practiced biofeedback is the, the quality of focus. Because on one hand, 
I believe what what when I when I learned from you with resonance frequency breathing is if I'm breathing at this rate, my respiratory sinus arrhythmia, I believe I'm using my vocab terms right here. In other words, the connection between my breath and my my heart rate, um, I should be getting in low frequency. However, what, what I have found twofold, one you gave me a bunch of crap about, which you were right, so I give you credit, is I was trying to cheat and like watch television while I was practicing residence frequency breathing and, and uh, you know, saw my scores drop significantly, including struggling to get an optimal zone. The other thing I've been paying attention to is the quality of my breath as well. And you do, you know, a great job talking about healthy breathing. So, I, you know, I don't know if there's science around this stuff, but like, I see that those two things, at least for me personally, have a huge impact on whether I may be at residence frequency, but my mind starts to wander. You know, I still think I'm hitting the inhale, exhale pretty well. I, I would say I'm, I'm a 90% there, maybe a little bit off, you know, but then like chest breathing versus belly breathing, you know, uh, all those like healthy breathing is also helping me get in there as well. So, so do those things are, 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 is there any science around how those things can impact low frequency as well or complement residence frequency breathing? So I don't, um, I don't, I don't, think there's been a study that looks at it in quite um, as much of a nuance as what you are talking about, Matt. Um, but I think I can address uh, this, you know, in maybe a little bit more of a general um, sense. Um, so staying in the low frequency uh, range uh, is important. Uh, but um, when you're, you know, let's say you're hitting your uh, inhale, you know, exhale rate, uh, just right, but you know your mind starts to wonder, starts thinking about stuff. Um, you know, if you are uh, tracking your frequencies at this time, what you're very likely to see is an increase in the very low frequency range. Uh, so you will still be primarily in low frequency, but the overall low frequency power will go down, and you will get a bit more power in the very low frequency. That you know that vagal mm. uh, vagal withdrawal is going to start happening. Um, so it will make your training a bit less um, efficient, even though you still hitting your um you know breathing rate uh, you know more or less uh, more or less on target um and the respiratory sinus arrhythmia that you brought up which is the synchrony between the heart rate and the breath right so as you breathe in heart rate going up as you breathe out or heart rate going down um is very much a part of determining your resonance frequency uh breathing mm -hmm. um you know it's the third uh, determinant that we uh, use um, in telling somebody this is your residence frequency uh, breathing rate. Um, granted, we have to be able to measure uh, actual breathing rate in order to do this. Yes. Uh, so not, not, not always possible. Uh, but uh, when the respiratory sinus arrhythmia is happening, um, the low we actually will increase uh, the efficiency of our training. Um, and if your breathing is a little bit off, like you know, if it's not belly breathing, if it's more chest breathing, it it might impact the synchrony between the heart rate mm. and the breath. Um, and again, will make the training just a tad bit uh, less uh, less efficient. So actually, paying attention, uh, being mindful. Um, will help both with uh, staying primarily um, in the low frequency zone and keeping that uh, percentage of being in the low frequency um, significantly higher um, and um, allowing that uh, RSA, the respiratory sinus arrhythmia to stay and uh, um, to help us out. I love that. And the other thing that I'm really excited about Optimal Zone too is that we give an all time average. Um, one, one of the things that, uh, you know, we, we've been working with as a company is how do you give people context for the, the, the HRV data that, that we present? And I really think, and I'm, what I'm really excited about is, you know, Optimal Zone is, is really a really simple metric uh, that, that you can compete you know, gently in a parasympathetic way, compete against yourself to improve your scores over time. And that's like what I'm seeing is like my 
my my 9 p.m. versus my 9 a.m. practice, whew, like it's like it can be like a 40 percent difference between those two scores, uh, which I think is is realistic to where my nervous system is. But, you know, I really think that improvement, seeing that improvement over time and, and really working on your baseline is another huge uh, thing to track that you don't always get after a biofeedback uh, practice. Um, absolutely. This is so important, right? You know, if there was no room for improvement, we shouldn't be doing this, right? You know, yeah. the whole point is to um, is to improve. Um, and uh, with heart rate variability, um, one of the awesome things about it uh, is there is always room uh, for improvement. Um, you know, when, uh, you know, we see, you know, somebody who is in a great, you know, great physical shape, you know, they're young, they're doing great, you know, their HRV is really high. Um, it's not that, well, okay, well, your HRV is high. Okay, you're good to go. Nothing, nothing we can do. That's not true. Uh, even for folks whose HRV is way above average, you know, for their um, age group, um, there's always going to be room for improvement. And what you're talking about, Matt, is one of them, you know, as you are uh, doing your biofeedback practice uh, over time, seeing an increase um, in both the percentage of time you're staying in your optimal zone um, and the actual total uh, low frequency power. Um, you know, you want both of these to go up. The percentage might kind of flatten out as you get really good at it. Uh, you know, you can't go much above 100%, right? Uh, so you might end up being at like, you know, that 95, 96, 97% um, optimal zone. As long as you're staying there, that's great. But then what you can continue tracking is an increase uh, in your total low frequency power, which your app will give you uh, as well. It will give you that feedback. Um, and uh, that means that your uh, training continues uh, to pay off and it's likely to translate uh, into an increase in your um, HRV at normal breathing at baseline when you're not uh, doing your training as well. So there's always room for improvement, no matter uh, where you start. If you're starting uh, you know, higher than uh, most people, if you're uh, uh, starting a little bit lower than where you'd like to be, um, you know, there is a number of indicators that you can track um, for, for progress. Excellent. And, and when we look at the, the, the low frequency number, cause I, that's a, that's, it's kind of, we, we do now give the all time average in this next release, which is really helpful. So, so it's another metric that we're just trying to get at or above. It just gives us another piece of information, which for the most time you could work the math out where this couldn't be the case, but the most time we're going to see low frequency higher if we see optimal zone higher as well. We've done the math. We know that that there could be exceptions to those rules, but so so we're improving that. We're also really focusing on max min as well. It's something we've we've given as a uh, marker after biofeedback practices, but we're also comparing that to an all-time score as well. So what when people get that after reading feedback because it's not something we're measuring necessarily with optimal zone what's what are we looking at with max min maybe, maybe give us a, a refresher on the definition of that and what are we really striving for there and should be in an optimal zone more you know increase our max min score i, I just love to to tie that into this as well um excellent another excellent question um Max min uh, refers to the difference um, that happens from the highest point on your heart rate oscillation down to the lowest point for each uh, of the of the your heart rate waves, right? So your heart rate goes up and it comes down, goes up and it comes down, right? And when you're doing your reading on the optimal app, you know you'll see that feedback: your heart rate going up and down, going up and down. Um, so what um, the algorithm is doing is say it's looking at the highest uh, uh, point of um, you know. Uh, for your heart rate um, and uh, looking at the lowest point and subtracting lowest from highest, you know, giving you that max min difference and then averaging it out uh, over whatever time um, you are training for, you know, two minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever it is. Um, and it's giving you kind of, you know, that, that average max min giving you, you know, basically telling you the how, um, large is the amplitude of those heart rate oscillations. Uh, the higher the amplitude of the heart rate oscillations, uh, the more effective your 
uh, training is. Um, and max min is the second determinant uh, behind low frequency for your residence, uh, residence frequency breathing, uh, right? So when we calculate your residence frequency breathing, the first thing we'll look at is low frequency power. The second is max min. And then the third, uh, if available, is the respiratory sinus um, arrhythmia, the synchrony between the heart rate and the breath. So max min is really, uh, really important because it's maximized when we are at our optimal breathing rate. Uh, so uh, there is definitely a correlation with uh, the optimal zone, even though the optimal zone focuses uh, you know, exclusively on the low frequency because that is the most important um, me measurement here. Um, max min will also increase um, as the efficiency of your training uh, increases. Um, and just like low frequency total power will increase uh, ideally over time as you do more and more practice, uh, max min uh, will increase uh, over time as you do uh, more and more practice as well. Again, giving you that feedback that you are on the right track with your training. And I can't help as, as you talk about max min, thinking about a child being pushed on a swing. I, I wonder to kind of wrap us up, uh, could, could you share that, that, because that analogy that you provide always helps me. Uh, could, do you mind sharing that for uh, listeners who may not have heard it? Because I, I think that that's a good way to kind of wrap this up and, and make it a little bit more simpler as we nerd out about all these frequencies and stuff. Do you mind sharing that analogy that I love so much with folks? Of course, yeah, I'm. Uh, I really, uh, I really like it too. Uh, so the swing analogy specifically refers to your resonance frequency, uh, breathing rate. Um, resonance, uh, you know, is a physics term, right? It refers uh, to the interplay, uh, you know, between two part of a system where one part of the system uh, stimulates the other part, producing maximum oscillations. Uh, so this is a, a really nice way of explaining what resonance frequency breathing um, is. So think of a child on a swing and, you know, you, uh, you know, pushing the swing. So you are, you know, one part of the system, the child on the swing, the other part of the system. Um, and you can stimulate that, you know, that swing uh, and with a child in it uh, in a number of different ways, right? You can push the swing with uh, just a ton of force and it will, you know, go up and be very uneven, kind of wobbly. And, you know, it will come back down and, you, you know, the child is going to be, oh my God, <laughs> you know, this is no fun. Don't do that. Yeah. Um, or, you know, you can push the swing with short, frequent bursts, right? And then the swing is going to go up just a little bit, uh, right? So the amplitude is going to be, you know, very, very small. And it's going to come right back down and the child is going to be, hey, this is no fun. Don't do that either, right? Uh, or uh, you can find a, a uh, regular measured way of pushing a swing so that each time you push the swing goes up as much as possible and comes down as much as possible, you know, uh, smoothly and uh, uh, regularly and comfortably, right? And then the child is so happy they never want to get off that swing. Um, and that's that resonance uh, frequency for uh, pushing the swing that you come up with, right? You know, that up as much as possible, down as much as possible. Now, returning this back to your breath and your heart rate, um, your uh, breath it stimulates the heart rate. So just like you stimulate the swing, uh, right? So you, we can find an optimal rate uh, of breathing that will produce maximal um, uh, heart rate, uh, your heart rate going up as much as possible during inhalation, right? And your heart rate going down as much as possible during the exhalation. So that's that oscillation. Um, and that's maximizing your max min uh, because, uh, you know, as the heart rate goes up more and comes down more, the difference from highest to lowest point is going to increase. Um, and, uh, you know, there is your maximum uh, oscillation, you know, ma uh, your highest max min that's happening at resonance frequency breathing rate and indicates most efficient uh, training. Beautifully said. I, I'm so glad. I, I, I Every time I hear you talk about pushing the kid on the swing, it's like, Okay, this just ties like like the max min just ties right in there in a beautiful way. By the way, you can you can get that, and and I know I I say this every time you're on the episode. Uh, Ina's book, Biofeedback and Mindfulness. I'm looking over at my bookshelf because I've got like a, a earmarked uh, uh, the copy that I've just gotten so much use of. Biofeedback and Mindfulness in Everyday Life. Uh, I it's in my like I rotate that book in every three to six months. Uh, just because I learned something new each and every time. So if you really want to take a, a deeper dive into this, 
I just can't recommend uh, Ina's book enough. It's been it's been my Bible and my learning curve. Uh, besides getting to talk to you, my friend, on a regular basis, uh, the, the book has been such a huge resource uh, for me as well. So um, I, you can tell we are we are really excited um, about this release. If you're not on the Optimal uh, HRV app, um, we'd obviously love to have you as part of our family. The, the things that you might be looking for, though, is, hey, how do you maybe go into a biofeedback practitioner to get residence frequency breathing rate? Um, once you get that, you can use that. You may not be with the biofeedback side of things, but just getting that residence frequency breathing rate um, has just been, you know, such a game changer for me. Uh, you know, I, I don't have such a beautiful analogy. I have actually a terrible analogy is I've been practicing mindfulness before residence frequency for about 10 years. Um, once I started residence frequency, you know, it was like going to the gym was mindfulness. Taking steroids and going to the gym was like residence frequency breathing. And I haven't found a better example or analogy. Healthy steroids. Healthy steroids. Healthy steroids, <laughs> if there's yeah. such things. Because you can tell, again, when I flex for the video, list, definitely not on steroids, but... Uh, nor have I ever been so, but it's just such a, it's, it's such a powerful uh, tool and you need a little bit of technology to, to get there, to get, get the readings and those pieces. And yet it's a powerful tool. And now with optimal zone for me, what I'm so excited about is you, you feel low frequency. And I think your point is that's a subjective feeling. And for me, it's like, okay, there's a morning low frequency and there's an evening low frequency and that is there's a lot of similarities, but because my state is different, my practice, you know, gives me a little bit more energy in the afternoon where it, it just is like my pregame warm up in the morning for work. I'm ready to go after about 20 minutes. So I, I'm really excited to bring uh, the, the science that you have really brought to Optimal to the masses, but just really encourage everybody to, to if you're not doing residence frequency breathing, uh, well, however you get it, um, I highly encourage you to do so because I think it's such a great, it's a great tool to have in my tool belt for sure. I couldn't agree more with you, Matt. And I think this is such a good point um, that, you know, we really do need uh, the measurements, at least initially, you know, however you get them, however you, however you can track, uh, you know, your uh, spectral frequencies um, in order to figure out what does uh, that optimal zone uh feel like you have to have measurements. There's no way to know initially. Once you do biofeedback, the whole point is for you not to, to be dependent uh, on technology all the time. Right. So you can, uh, and you know, people do absolutely learn what it feels like to be in that optimal zone. And uh, I very much encourage people to really uh, pay attention to what that optimal zone feels like so that, uh, you know, if you find yourself in the middle of a stressful situation where pulling out your phone for that pacer is not an option, uh, knowing how to get into it and, you know, yeah. know what it feels like is so, so, so important. Um, but you've got to have some measurements first. There's yeah. a, there's not a way to know for sure uh, without those measurements, at least for a while. Yep. And again, we're, we're trying to make that, and I think we've done a good job making that affordable to everybody. So um, obviously, you know, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really excited to start uh, getting user feedback on this. So uh, for our users, uh, as you start your optimal zone journey, give us the feedback. We're, we're always learning. We want to know. I know what it feels like for me. I'm, I'm just uh, really excited to uh, experience this with our community uh, at Optimal as, as we introduce this and people roll out. So uh, thank you for this gift. Uh, I know it's been a long journey. Uh, I, I, I might try to get some of our uh, technology people on here because if you think this is easy to do, uh, that's where I would like, because as complex as I think, you know, Fred's segment was with like looking at the frequency domains, you know, the technology side of uh, really getting this to our users has been such a fascinating journey as, as well. And, uh, you know, it wasn't just like, oh, put this algorithm into an Excel spreadsheet and then everything's done. So uh, I think uh, we've all learned a lot along the way and it's just exciting that this is available 
uh, to our users. So thank you, Ida, for, for uh, helping us along this journey. And I can't wait to get this, uh, uh, get feedback uh, from our community. Thank you, Matt. I am so excited to finally be getting this out uh, to people. Can't wait for uh, impressions and feedback. Uh, so please, please give us give us a shout out. Tell us how it's going. Absolutely. And as always, you can find show notes, uh, information on OptimalHRV.com. And uh, Ina, thanks so much. And uh, we'll see you next week, everybody. Bye.